So the past couple of weeks, we've spent looking at two prophets' words regarding the future hope of God and the Messiah to come. We heard in the first week of Advent from Jeremiah how in the midst of gloom and death of God's great people in the Babylonian exile, God had not given up on them, and he would bring forth life from that death. The hope of the Messiah would start small in the form of a little baby born in an insignificant manger, but would continue to grow and show the world God's power and majesty in many mighty ways. In the midst of darkness, there was still a little light that the people could hope in from Jeremiah's words. Then last week, we heard from Malachi about the terror of being in the very presence of God himself. God's Messiah would come as a purifying refiner who would work in us to rid us of our filth and impurities. Passing through this terrifying, purifying fire of God will be uncomfortable, but it will be good. We know that we are all sinners and therefore subject to God's wrath. But we also know that God's wrath was consumed in Jesus Christ on the cross so that we might know his love and mercy by choosing to allow Christ to rule and shape our lives in every way. And while it is good and brings us hope, there's still a bit of fear that we feel in knowing we will have to face that uncomfortable process. Today's reading from Zephaniah reveals the coming glory of God's restored reign over his creation. And while it does not specifically mention Christ himself, we know from the rest of the story of Scripture how God intends to establish this kingdom through him. While we know there is great fear and trembling before God, Zephaniah invites us to recognize that the faithful will cast aside any fear that they might harbor and rejoice knowing that the Lord will set all things right. One of my favorite Advent hymns to sing every year is O Little Town of Bethlehem, which we sang this morning. One article I read had this to say about that hymn. The lovely song was penned in 1868 by a famous preacher named Phillips Brooks. The Civil War had ended only three years earlier. Yes, Lee and Grant had signed the peace accord at Appomattox and shaken hands on the deal. Yes, battle-weary veterans from both sides had laid down their arms and trudged home. But half the nation still lay in ruins. And the notorious Andrew Johnson, by most accounts the worst president of the United States the nation had ever seen, was doing his best to dismantle the rights that had been won for the former slaves at such a terrible human cost. On the home front in both the North and the South, families had been decimated by the carnage of the most brutal war America had ever known. Wives and mothers counted themselves lucky if their husbands and boys came home lacking an arm or a leg, or even an eye, or shivering from PTSD. They knew he easily could not have come home at all. In 1868, it gave Americans some comfort. To picture the humble Bethlehem stable as the place where hope and fear meet each other. Where hope emerges as the ultimate victor. To put it another way, the manger in Bethlehem is like a wrestling cage. Where a battle to the death was waged. Even to this day, I think we still tend to watch that scene To see who's going to win in our lives, too. In this corner, we have the heavyweight hitter, the tiger of terror, ready to pounce on his next victim. The one, the only fear. And in this corner, the challenger, the swaddled savior, the turner of the other cheek, coming straight from heaven to earth, Jesus the Christ. That was my best impression of a wrestling announcer that I could come up with. (laughs) In the end, though, after all the rounds have been fought, The winner emerges, and it is hope in Jesus Christ every single time. Fear has no shot at even thinking about winning when Jesus Christ puts up his dukes. It is why the enemy so often tries to tempt us, though, to despair 
And to lose any sense of possibility for optimism, to turn our gaze away from Christ, is to lose and give in to fear. Zephaniah's words for us in the third chapter actually come after two and a half chapters of accusations against all the people of earth that certainly caused some fear and despair. In chapter 1, the Lord declares that all of creation is guilty of sin and deserving of his divine judgment. Like with all of the other prophets, there's a great condemnation across the board as people have strayed far away from their creator. The whole chapter, God speaks to the consequences of sin and complacency and indifference toward the Lord. As you read further then in chapter 2, God's wrath begins to target all those peoples around Israel. Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Cush, and Assyria. Now this should be striking in a few ways based on what the prophet has to say to them. The fact that God's prophet has anything to say to other nations at this point is, is sort of striking. It reveals that God's concern isn't just for Israel, but all peoples to know him. God cares enough to call all around to repentance. Even though they were not God's chosen instrument in those days, these places around Israel were just as guilty because they led others astray and replaced Yahweh with false gods like Baal and Milcom. Now at this point, it's easy for God's people to start jeering those people groups and think they have avoided the worst of God's wrath. Yeah, maybe they weren't the best and things were still not the greatest looking for them too, but hey, at least they weren't those awful Moabites who were going to become like Sodom. Or, or, you know, we're not like those, those Cushites who, who were only lucky enough to get one verse of condemnation that would say they would be slain by God's sword. Hey, we're not that bad, right? But then Zephaniah's crosshairs focus in on God's chosen Israel. Suddenly, they seem to receive the harshest of God's complaints. Jerusalem, which is used as a moniker for all of God's people is called a city of oppressors whose rulers are like evening wolves that devour everything they can and whose priests profane the sanctuary. Yikes. God has a lot to say about everyone, it would seem. No one is safe from his anger. And yet, the final words from Zephaniah suddenly turn from all minor chords into major ones. Rather than all the destruction we expect, we hear God will purify us. Rather than disappearing forever, God will right the wrongs and we will receive redemption. And finally, restoration to what the Lord had originally intended for his creation. What, all, what does all of this have to do with Advent? Aren't we kind of past all of that stuff? Well, yes and no. When Jesus was born, he was brought into a world still very much like that of Zephaniah's day. The backdrop for Jesus' birth was that of the ravaging Roman Empire responsible for many atrocities. A monstrous half-Jewish ruler, King Herod, who would kill any who might pose even a tiny threat to his power. And the wide array of injustices neglect and crimes committed all around by various individuals which left many destitute and without much hope at all in life that's what jesus entered into when he was born and it's the same world in which he ministered to it was that same world then that rejected him and sentenced him to die and it's the same world that still exists today. For many, the question in light of the story of Advent and Christmas and the situation of today's world still being full of such vices and injustices is this. If God really wants us to believe in him, why doesn't he come out of hiding? It is at some level a valid question to ponder, isn't it? The problem is that just like the world still being mired in its sin, many still expect God to show up in a powerful 
and majestic way such that no one can question his true divinity. Just like the Hebrew people who expected a conquering, warring king as a Messiah, many today expect God to show up in the world with gusto and fanfare. No one wants the suffering servant. He's weak. He's passive. He's not good enough. It is such an ironic predicament to want God so very much and yet do all we can to reject him when he finally arrives simply because it does not fit our expectations. We watch and wait for him to come, but when he finally does, we think, nothing really seems to change. There's still sickness, famine, crime, Death, malice, and all sorts of other maladies in the world. How can we be joyful and worship God when it seems like he doesn't care? But he does. Zephaniah reminds us why. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The angels who appeared to the shepherds remind us why. I bring you good news. A Savior has been born. Jesus himself reminds us why. I have come that you might have life. The hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem, reminds us why. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. <laughs> Thank you. In our recently finished Bible study, The Prodigal God, we learned from Tim Keller how the well-known parable of the prodigal son actually reflects the whole narrative of God's creation and story. At the end, we're invited to recognize we live between the time when God offered redemption through the cross and resurrection of Christ and the coming restoration of the whole of creation. The beauty of it all is that our joy comes not from knowing everything is perfect in the right now, but that in the fullness of the coming kingdom, it will be. And Keller likens the future day like a feast. A feast in the biblical sense was more than just a meal, though. It was a celebration. Everyone was invited. It involved the best food and drink, it involved dancing and singing and jubilation. And it involved rekindling friendships and relationships that may have been long lost. Zephaniah invites us to find joy in that coming day. Especially this Advent season, it's appropriate that we look forward to the return of Christ. In spite of God's wrath against sin, the hope of Advent is summed up in the birth of the Christ child who brings with him the hope of a glorious kingdom of heaven in which we will shout for joy over God's reign. But it means that God will interrupt us. It means that we will be called to recognize our own indifference and complacency to the evils around us. And it will mean submitting to an authority far greater than any of our own. But it will also mean joining in a time of celebration. And it will mean that we, too, will find our seat at the table when the feast is finally prepared. So watch with wonder, amazement, hope, and joy as God does a wonderful thing in this world once again. Amen.